So we go on to rejection detection in resuscitation and treatment of that. And we thought the, the most difficult part, of course, was the surgery, but it ended up also being a follow-up that was a kind of complicated of this organ. Uh, Michael talked a little bit about organ rejection before. Uh, this is not our primary subject, of course, so I'm quickly going to take you through it. It's, you have three, mainly three uh, groups of uh, rejection. You have the hyperacute one, which is immediate, can even be during surgery. You have the acute rejection, uh, which is within the first three months. Lots of patients get these episodes of acute rejection, but you can resolve them if you detect them. And there's also the chronic rejection, usually not appearing within the first three months, but after 100 days, uh, it's common to occur. And if you have an organ for a very long time, most recipients may have an uh, inflammatory response, chronic inflammatory response. But we were put to this question before, how do you monitor a uterus? No one knows, so we have to make it up. Uh, when you look at all the other organs, they have specific blood samples, they have specific tests, you can know if it's not working. But how on earth do you monitor a uterus? The first human attempt in Saudi Arabia, they used a follow-up of measuring the subpopulation of CD4 and CD4 8 uh, helpers, the cell ratio, and they also did the uterine artery Doppler ultrasound to study the flow volume, first fatality, and resist resistance index. But they did not perform any biopsies. Uh, and the reason for that is that they didn't dare to do it. They thought this was a, they didn't want to harm the organ. The second human attempt had a, f a follow up of, uh, of course, the same Doppler ultrasound. They also looked at the cervix through the speculum uh, examination. They took biopsies. They used the transplanted vaginal rim uh, during the first three months. And after that, they went into the endometrium and took biopsies from that. And they tried to evaluate signs of stasis, hemorrhage, edema, epithelial cells, necrotic cells, the usual thing you see in histology uh, when you look at it. Our follow-up. We saw the patients the first month twice weekly. Uh, after that, once weekly for a couple of months, and from month five and onwards every third week. We did transvaginal ultrasound. We did, of course, uh, Doppler examinations, both of the uterine arteries bilaterally, and also looked at the tissue perfusion of the cervix, where we have this kind of laser Doppler that we can measure the tissue uh, perfusion. And we also did blood testing every time. What we ended up with, and what we also saw in the non-human primates, the thing that correlates mostly with uh, rejection or episodes of rejection is biopsies. And we have chosen to take cervical biopsies. We, in the baboon, we tried to also do the endometrial biopsies, but we found out that there was a cervical biopsies telling more about the graft function than the endometrial ones. And also, in addition, if you don't do endometrial biopsies, you don't um, have to go into the uterus and maybe harm something within the cavity. This is the same picture as Matt showed. As you can see, we have had episodes of acute rejection in four patients. This is during the first six months. One patient had two episodes of acute rejection, all detected by the cervical biopsies. Uh, this is, of course, there were, no one had looked at rejection in uterus cervical biopsies before. So what we did was that we looked at other organs, how do they categorize their um, rejections, and we came up with this scale. We did this in the non-human primates, and we were able to divide it into no rejection, mild, moderate, severe, and total necrosis. What happened when we looked at the humans was that we added a category up here. In between no rejection and mild, we also put a borderline. 
rejection. And the borderlines we did not treat, but we followed them with um, a new biopsy one week later. And in some cases, it went back to no rejection, and in some cases, it went to mild rejection, and then we chose to treat it. And all of those episodes that I showed you before, the five episodes, have been in this category, the mild rejection. And what do we do when we detect this? This is, of course, the immunosuppression we use, but I'm going to focus on this thing. This is the treatment we give for episodes of acute rejection. As you can see here, they get three boluses of methylprednisolone. It's 500 milligrams once daily, and that's IV. And during this time, we keep them in the hospital. Afterwards, they get a tapering protocol of corticosteroids during one week up to 10 days. And if you look at the histology, this is one of the patients, this is actually the patient who had two rejection episodes. This is her normal cervix. You can see the myometrium, endometrium, looks perfectly normal. This is during one of the episodes of, of rejection. You can see lots of inflammatory lymphocytes here. You can even see some apoptotic bodies here. And she then get corticosteroids for three days and the tapering protocol of corticosteroids. And what happens afterwards? Oh, it's back to normal. This is after two weeks after the treatment. So that we made the conclusion that if we can detect these episodes early, we can, of course, treat them and resolve them, as in as any organ transplantation. The problem is detecting them. I think we can go on to the next presentation at once, and then we'll take questions afterwards. Where do we interrupt? Okay. So I'm going to continue talking about the exit strategies. Because what do we do if this fails? We have to have a plan. And there has been termination of ongoing uterus transplantation in three cases so far. You all know by now about the case in Saudi Arabia. Three months, then necrosis and hysterectomy. Two of our cases, Mats talked about, one due to resistant infection, the other one due to uh, thrombosis bilaterally, we have removed the uterus. And this is important thing to think through before you do the procedure. You have to have an exit strategy for every step of the procedure to, to not stand there one day and think, what, what shall we do? You should have the plan before. This is uh, roughly what we have done, we have divided the procedure into different steps, and they should all, as I said, have an exit strategy. I'm going to take you through this a little bit at a time, so you don't have to, don't worry about the picture. Uh, the first ones, first, this is prior to, to uh, the transplantation, of course, during the evaluation of the recipient. It's important, first of all, that the recipient has a knowledge of the alternatives she has to receive parenthood. Uh, and if you see that there is anything wrong with the recipient physically or psychologically, do not proceed. If you go on to the next step, this is a transplantation itself. If you, during surgery, have life-threatening events, if you have a very long operative time, or you find out that the organ you're about to transplant or the vessels associated with the organ is not suitable, well, don't go any further. And this is, of course, a collaboration between the surgeons and the anesthesiologists, as in every surgery. And here you can use the classification system that Michael talked about, the Clavian Dindo, uh, where you can actually categorize uh, life-threatening bleeding, for example, is number four, right? Yeah, and then you should definitely stop the procedure, of course. And if you go on to the next step, that's the immediate post-operative care, or maybe the first couple of days afterwards, you may end up with thrombosis or acute rejection, 
And the first thing you do, of course, is that you try to treat that uh, event. But if you don't succeed with the treatment, or you get, again, a life-threatening event like hemorrhage, well, don't proceed. Do a hysterectomy and uh, get it over with. If you continue, then you have the long-term post-operative care. We, as you saw in one case, had this resistant rejection. We couldn't solve it. We tried for several months. She got worse and worse. And after a while, we decided we can't proceed. It's not ethically correct. So we did a hysterectomy. This might also happen with rejections, of course. And if you look at it in the long run, Michael talked about the risk of immunosuppression, for example, that you can get malignancies developing. If you get any of these things, perform a hysterectomy um, because you don't want it to, this is a non-vital organ transplantation. Remember that all the time. Don't take any risk. Do a hysterectomy before you risk the patient. Next step is when you get to the point where you think, okay, we, this is going fairly well, we're going to try to get pregnancies, then you have to down-regulate down the immunosuppressants that it's not good for the fetus and the pregnancy. We talked earlier about MMF. You have to remove that. And this is, of course, Michael would argue that you will always succeed with this because there are other, always another alternative. But in case you don't, then do a hysterectomy. Because the purpose of this organ transplantation is the pregnancy and birth with a healthy, of a healthy child. That differs this transplantation from other organ transplantations, of course. Last step here in this slide is the embryo transfer. What happens if you run out of embryos? We do the simulation prior to the transplantation. We have frozen embryos, but we might run out of them. Or what happens if you have no success? Uh, well, should you do new stimulations? Of course, that's, that's the first thing you think about, do. And you can probably even do that after transplantation. I know the Turkish team have done fresh cycles after the transplantation. But how many embryo transfers should you do before you give up? And here, if you come to the case where you have a pregnancy, they might end up in miscarriage, missed abortion, as every other pregnancy, of course. And what do you do then? Do you do surgical or medical abortion if you have a missed abortion? Should it be vaginal or cesarean? Because remember, some of these Meyer-Rokitansky girls, they have a skin vagina which cannot dilate so much. So what happens if you have a miscarriage in week 25 or 26, something like that? You have to have a strategy. How would you handle that? And the patient also needs to, to know how we think about every step. What happens when the baby is born? If you have a healthy child, should you get another chance of pregnancy? And what happens? And how many pregnancies should we consider to be ethically correct? And how long times in between the pregnancy should we allow? Because we want also to, to be able to remove the organ as soon as possible to, to keep the patient off immunosuppressants for a couple of years. And finally, we come down to this. Who decides when it's time to remove the uterus? Is it us? We would like to think so, but can we remove the uterus without the patient's con consent? I think it would be difficult, and I know that in other organ transplantations, of course, that you can never remove the uterus without the patient's consent. And what happens if she has two healthy babies and she doesn't want to give up her uterus? Is that correct to keep the uterus, even if we know that the long-term use of immunosuppression may harm her? Lars, do you want to say anything more about the fresh IVF and, and so on? Or? Yeah, I should say something. It's, uh, 
it, it seems to be easier than first believed. I, I think it would be possible to do fresh cycles after. The, the Turkish team has done it, and uh, in most cases, it's not too difficult. I think the Turkish team they had seven embryos, and uh, they used those up for the first transfers, and that's why they do a second round. 